Welcome back to Fursuit Futures, the series where we look to the distant horizons of dressing up as a burly bunny or voluptuous vole. I am your mad science educator, R.K. Since at least the 1800s, probably earlier, science fiction authors have speculated giving humans animal traits or vice versa. But modern medicine is making that sci-fi a reality. So fold up your wings and grab a seat that lets your tail hang out. Booking your next vacation on the island of Dr. Moreau is culturally effed. Last time, we talked about using gene therapy to transform you into your fursona. But needles are scary, and changing the DNA of a living person is complex and leaves little room for error. So, why not just start without the person? Just grow your fancy new anthrey body parts in a lab. Once they're ready, surgeons can install them, much in the same manner as a modern-day organ transplant. Medical science is already branching out into this, with lab-grown versions of damaged organs already being implanted successfully into patients. Strictly speaking, nothing is stopping us from doing the same thing to turn you into a tie-dye hippie chameleon. It's just a matter of growing the right parts and installing them. Growing tissue in a lab is entirely possible. Scientists use stem cells to grow new tissue for repairing damaged hearts, for example. But the process gets more complex as you try to get multiple types of tissue to grow together in the right kind of structures that you want. Let's say you want to grow a tiger tail first. We need to tailor some tiger DNA to your DNA so your body doesn't reject it. This means changing things around like blood and stuff. Second, we need to get it to grow into the right shape for bones, blood vessels, muscles, and so on. That would probably involve some type of framework the cells can grow on and eventually replace. You'd want to make sure everything lines up with where you're going to install it, which in this case means taking a 3D map of the nerves and vasculature of your butt. Third, we need to keep the cells alive while they grow. You need to make sure every part of the tail gets the right nutrients and keeping it at the right temperature. Fourth, we need to grow it faster than tiger tails grow on regular tigers. We might need it to be ready for the next fur con after all. And we need it to function, so it might need electrical stimulation to build up muscles. And probably some of your cloned or donated blood injected with an isotope that can track to make sure the veins and arteries all go where they should, which is just as well because by that point you're going to need blood vessels to distribute nutrients to all of that new tissue anyway. Fifth, we need to attach it to you. That means tying it in with all the nerves and blood vessels and bones you've got in your rump. Nerves in particular are very difficult to connect. Bones, on the other hand, are relatively easy. They just take time to heal, like a hip replacement. Of course, you'd then have to learn how to move it and remember not to slam it in doors or in elevators. Finally, we need that tail to last. If it's going to be part of your body, we need it to function for 60 years, 80 years, a century. That means making sure the cells don't age a bunch before it gets attached to you, preventing the gene damage that sneaks in over many cell divisions. It also needs to be compatible with all the hormones and other chemicals your body produces. And it needs blood vessels big enough for human cells. This tactic probably entails the longest recovery period of the techniques we are covering. You're undergoing at least one major surgery for each body part you're altering. You'd probably want to take them one at a time to give your body a chance to recover. Ethics, putting the lab in Labrador. 
From an ethical standpoint, growing a replacement organ is a pretty safe bet. Your tiger tail was never part of a living creature, so it's more ethical than any given bucket of fried chicken. Of course, you are a living creature, so you're going to need to sign off uh, before someone starts grafting new furry parts onto you. And since much of the process takes place outside your body, you're not in danger of during the early development of the tech. Better to have the tissue fail in the petri dish than in your body. Monitoring a tissue culture's progress is also much easier in a lab than it is in you. Hence why your high school spent good money on model skeletons, even though you brought perfectly good bones to class. Again, these sort of developments would have huge benefits for people with lost or damaged limbs. Growing a new human leg isn't that much different than growing a new tiger one. The knowledge of how to hook them up properly would also carry over. What's more, figuring out how to stop cells from aging would be great for furries and non-furries alike. Being a gray muzzle would be optional, not mandatory. Though, if furries were living for centuries, we would need to have a QR code on our badges so you can look up all of the previous personas you might have met us under. But why bother with all this messy biotech? With just a few electronic parts, we can become a radical cyborg civet. Join us next time as we link in with the world of fursuit cybernetics. I have been your host, RK. This has been Fursuit Futures on Culturally Eft. This episode was written by Tempe Okun with help from Nasido. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Comment down below if any of today's treatments seem appealing or ridiculously out of this world to you. And if you want to see videos early, help us out by subscribing on Patreon. See you again sooner than you think. Did you like when I said tissue? Or do you prefer tissue? What's the issue?